Namaste. A new movie has come out called Mohenjo-daro, named after the great ancient city of the Indus Saraswati civilization. And so I saw it right away in order to understand what are the positions the movie is taking uh, concerning the major controversies that exist about that civilization. So before telling you about the movie, I will tell you a little bit for those who do not know the background. I will tell you what is the Indus Saraswati civilization, what is known about it, what is controversial, what people fight about, why that is important politically today. Uh, and then I will tell you about the movie and what messages it is giving because it is giving major messages hidden. Some are very explicit, some you got to know the background and look for it. So I, will, I want you to be uh, well educated about this movie and its background and its messages because this will be a topic of conversation. It is also a great way to learn in a very friendly, nice, entertaining way the history of this whole thing and how different schools of thought have interpreted it, different Indologists, Western, Indian, Pakistani, various people have interpreted these facts. And so this way uh, the movie can serve as an educational vehicle for you. Also you can argue and debate and discuss with knowledge with your friends who are watching this movie. Uh, I do think you should watch this movie but first listen to what I have to say because then you will know what to look for. Okay, a brief background. There is an Indus, Val Indus Saraswati civilization which goes along the Indus river which is now in Pakistan and a Saraswati river which is in India but has gone underground uh, it, because of tectonic shifts. The river is not visible except in some places but satellite images and so on can tell you where the river was. And there are over 2000 towns and cities of various sizes that have been discovered uh, that are part of this civilization because they use the same tiles, construction material, architectural features and these uh, script the letters on, on tiles uh, which have not been decoded. So that consistency tells you that they are part of one civilization across a huge area of land uh, half the size of Europe that big and la that lasted like four or five thousand years from the beginning till the end. So it is an amazing story not fully understood, not fully decoded which makes it very interesting. So uh, the this Indus Saraswati civilization was unknown until the beginning of the 20th century when it was discovered and the, the first discovery was this huge town called Mahenjo-daro which is now in Pakistan. And then another town called Harappa was discovered, then various other places in Gujarat, Lothal, Dholavira and so on. I will talk about all that. Now what is known before we talk about what is controversial? What is known is that this civilization had uh, was very advanced, had two bedroom, two level, two, two story houses made of bricks. Uh, in other ancient civilizations they used stone because bricks is made out of clay, requires high temperature, other people did not have it. They had, they innovated many things, running water, running drainage, sewage systems, underground water storage so it would last the whole year, well planned cities, wide roads, public baths, uh, all that thousands of years ago uh, at the time of the pyramids and even before. So this is a very amazing civilization which still has not made its way properly into school textbooks and the popular culture uh, because uh, not enough is, has been studied about it. Now the facts of its prosperity are well established, its uh, scientific technological advancements are well established. Many things were are found there for the first time anywhere in the world. What is This is the background. Now there are some controversies. What is the relationship between this civilization and the Vedas? That is what it is all about. So Western Indologists have believed since the time they discovered this that the Vedas were developed by Aryans in a foreign country, somewhere north, maybe Europe, maybe Central Asia, maybe these Stan countries, Russia, whatever. Uh, and these, they were the Sanskrit speakers who brought this to India. They, some people say they brought it with violence, some say they came peacefully, but that does not matter. The point is the, according to this theory they are foreigners who brought Sanskrit and Vedas and hence the foreign origin of the Vedic civilization. When they came to this uh, Harappan, this, this Indus Saraswati area, uh, they, were, they saw this very advanced civilization. Some say they destroyed it, some say they assimilated there and the two of them mixed. 
that is another variation that is not so significant. The point is that these foreign Vedic and Sanskrit speaking people mixed with the local who, who the local people worshipped images, the Vedic people did not. Uh, the local people had mother goddess and uh, river goddess and things like that which the Vedic people did not according to this theory. So, they mixed these two and out of this mixture came the caste system because they wanted to separate themselves from the locals and this mixture uh, caste based thing became known as Hinduism in modern times, but earlier it was called something else. So, that is a history uh, which is being taught and it, its implication is north south divide because they, they say the south Indians are the Dravidians and the north Indians are predominantly sort of uh, Aryan heritage. Uh, and, and it also creates this Brahmin Dalit divide because the Dalits are told that uh, this caste system was created and these Brahmins are these foreign Aryans who mixed up and got uh, created a privilege for themselves and they became the Brahmins and the rest who they conquered became the Dalits. So, the Dalits are told that you have always been oppressed by Hinduism and things like that. So, there are some significant political ramifications. Also, what is said is that since the, since the civilization that the Hindus are proud of is a foreign origin and close to Europe and Middle East kind of thing, Central Asia. So, what is wrong if they if we assimilate Mughals, Muslim culture because that is also foreign origin, but what is wrong? We are we are already proud of the Vedic heritage of foreign origin. So, we should also be proud of Islamic heritage and Christian heritage and western uh, other western kind of ideas because so what if these are foreign? We already uh, there is nothing Indian anyway because the whole Vedic heritage is foreign. So, some foreign heritage is old, some foreign heritage is new, but it is all foreign, we got nothing of our own. So, there is not such a thing as a, an Indian civilization per se and so this school of thought makes fun of uh, Hinduism, they call it all kinds of names, it is radical, it is right wing, uh, Hindutva, all that kind of stuff. So, this is the background on which the, uh, the, uh, the whole story is being told in this movie. Now, there are some very specific reasons why arguments are given a certain way one way or the other in this controversy. One is the Vedic Vedas describe horses and so the western Indologists say there are no horses found in the Indus Saraswati civilization and hence it could the Vedas could not have been written there. They had to be foreign because there were no horses in, in the Indian subcontinent and of course, the Indian Indologists say that is not true there are there is evidence of horses. I will tell you what the movie has to say about the horses, but you have to wait for that. Uh, another issue is language. What language did they speak? So, some people say they spoke Sanskrit, but it was not written in Devanagari at the time and these little alphabets on various tiles which is prevalent all over the Indus Saraswati civilization, different symbols and so on. Uh, these are some other form of writing of Sanskrit. And then the western Indologists say that uh, actually these are not any writing of language at all. They are like symbols, logos, they, they represent a caste or a tribe, uh, they represent some kind of trading symbols, you know that you have paid your tax, you get a receipt, uh, you have some privilege and so on. So, these are not to be considered language at all. And then there are those who say well this is some kind of a, a proto-Dravidian language out of which Tamil originated, some say that this is linked with West Asian Middle Eastern languages from Mesopotamia and, and so on. So, the issue of what is language, what do these seals mean, what was their language is an important issue because it relates to all the other controversies. So, these are some of the, uh, the some of the issues and more uh, more uh, uh, issues will come out as I as I go. At the very beginning there is a very quick disclaimer which says that uh, this movie is not uh, taking any position on uh, uh, Vedic origins and what not and this is very quick because it is about 8, 10 lines you can hardly read it, it is just for a few seconds and they take it away. I think it is for legal purposes just to cover themselves, ok. But it does not matter what they say, the point is that in practice they are giving messages, they are taking a stand one way or the other, some stands are for, some are against, it is kind of muddled up, I will try to explain all that detail to you. The movie is a very high production quality in terms of the value of production, acting, theater, drama, uh, you know photography, filming all of that. And there is a love story, you know there is this boy, this girl, this problems with family this and that and then what gets how it gets sorted out. So, this is and some dance one Bollywood dance also. So, this is all uh, to attract you make it interesting and attractive. So, it is not a documentary and the messages about the history 
and the, la the language and the religions or whatever, the sacredness, those messages are in the background, but they are there. They are, they are very clearly being mentioned, but that's not what uh, holds your attention. The whole, what holds your attention is his love story and all the intrigue and battles and all that sort of stuff going on, very much in a Bollywood style. So there is a, uh, above the sur there is a surface level uh, kind of entertainment quality, uh, and then there are deep subliminal messages, uh, which if you know what to look for, uh, they are very clear. Okay, and I will tell you what they are, so you should watch the movie and be looking out for these. Let's start. First thing is, in the movie, very often, when people are speaking, and they are speaking Hindi, because it's for modern audiences, but when they are speaking, uh, in, bra in parentheses at the bottom it says, uh, speaking such and such language. And all those languages are from the Middle East and Central Asian countries. So in one place it says, speaking Sumerian language which is from Sumeria, near, it's in the Middle East. Speaking Makkan, it says, Makkan is from Makkah, the birthplace of Muhammad. So some other people are speaking that language. Uh, speaking Bukharan, Bukhara, which is in Uzbekistan today. Uh, speaking Dilmun, which is a Semitic language in Mesopotamia, uh, or, and so on. Now, the only present, the only language you recognize from the Indian subcontinent mentioned as being spoken there is old Sindhi, ancient Sindhi it says, but that's it. That's because Mahendra is there, you can't deny that, I mean it's located in there. So, uh, but you see, Sindhi is well known to be derived out of Sanskrit. So, Sanskrit is absent. This is very interesting. No mention of Sanskrit explicitly or implicitly. There is explicit mention of these Middle Eastern languages and North, uh, you know, Central Asian, Uzbekistan type languages. Not a single explicit mention of any Sanskrit type, nor a by implication that somebody could be saying Om or no Vedic ritual about fire altar, no yogi, uh, no symbolic presence of Vedic culture. They do have a priest. He does wear saffron. There is. Uh, puja to the mother goddess, okay, and the mother goddess represents the river. So, but you see, according to the foreign Aryan Indologists who theorize the foreign Aryan theory, the Vedas didn't have these things. These are things picked up from the natives. So, the Vedas are foreigners, foreign Aryans. They have a very masculine kind of a thing, no images. They're worshipping uh, things like Agni and all without use of images, and generally masculine is what their theory is. And they integrate and, and dis di uh, digest. They digest the local, uh, local religions, which have all these other elements that are digested. And then comes Hinduism. So the movie is showing a period before the Aryans have come, before the Vedas have come, before Sanskrit has come. Of course, this issue of how did Sindhi exist if Sanskrit wasn't there is left unanswered. Okay? So you have to catch that one. So this is, a, this is the view of, of Indologists. Uh, like Steve Farmer uh, in the Indology group, like this Devdat Patnaik type people, uh, like all these Wendy Doniger, Sheldon Pollock, a whole lot of these kind of people. And Pakistanis believe, pa there is a book called The 5,000 Year Old Pakistan. There is a book like that, by, which got a lot of awards in Pakistan. And what they are saying is that this whole Harappa, Mohenjo Daro, all this civilization is actually an extension of the Middle East. What started in Mesopotamia, Sumeria, Egypt, you know, that sort of moved on and became part of this whole Indus Saraswati civilization. It's all one block. It has nothing to do with Indian civilization. Uh, and so it is much older than any Indian civilization. And that is sort of the old history of Pakistan. So that, so the fact that Pakistan is based on Islam, which also came from the Middle East, should not be a surprise, should not be anything troubling, because we've been, we've been living off of Middle East uh, imports of civilization all the time. So it fits into that without ever saying so. It fits into that. The ideas fit into that, but it is never mentioned. Now, the, uh, the interesting thing is that the people who are traders, who come very rich people, traders, they mention that this guy comes from here, this guy comes from there. The traders from the Middle East are portrayed as very rich and very sophisticated and very high class people. That they high class people have come, you bow to them. So the guy is wearing these hats like Turkish hats or Middle Eastern, whatever. You, it's clear that they have come from that part of the world and they are given high respect by the local people. Then there is a, 
रोम स्टाइल ग्लैडिएटर फाइट सो समबडी हैज टू बी पनिश्ड सो ही हैज टू फाइट सम वेरी मॉन्स्ट्रस मैन ईटर्स कैनिबल पीपल हु फाइट दिस काइंड ऑफ लाइक यू सी इन अ रोमन मूवी यू नो देयर इज अ स्टेडियम एंड ऑल द पीपल आर सिटिंग देयर वाचिंग दिस हैपन देयर आर सीन्स लाइक दैट सो दिस काइंड ऑफ अ कल्चर एग्जिस्ट्स नाउ देयर आर वर्लिंग डांसर्स लाइक यू सी दीस डांसर्स फ्रॉम टर्की यू आल्सो सी देम इन जोधा अकबर सेम डायरेक्टर Uh, they are there they, there is a scene like that of course then there is also a bollywood dance to show you that the that the culture there was a mishmash cosmopolitan there was no single religion there was so no single language there were there, it was a postmodern you know and it's always been a crossroads of all kind of people and so therefore we should be very open everything is same it it, it feeds the ideology of those sort of people a, a postmodern society and will make many indians very proud that you know wow we had this it's almost like manhattan you know these people were from all over the world they came they were very elitist had sophistication but there is no presence of sanskrit vedas none of that none of the no, no spiritual heritage of india that we are proud of today exists at that time according to this movie okay so the other interesting thing is that the greatness uh, all the superior things coming from the west to the east reach harap the reach mahendra daro and then later when mahendra daro gets destroyed i'll come to in a moment how it gets destroyed in the movie when it gets destroyed people move further east and there is empty land they keep moving further east and they come to this huge river yeah and they decide we'll settle down and somebody asks what are we going to name it and the hero says ganga so the implication is that ganga was sort of discovered by the people who are refugees from mahendra daro who city got destroyed so they went and they discovered this place and they just gave it the name ganga of course according to our tradition ganga is goddess it's not a name given by some random human beings ganga is goddess and the river is her manifestation she manifests herself on this earth for a reason as the river ganga and that's why we worship ganga it's not that the river was there and some guys came from the middle east or from the uh, uh, mahendra daro and just gave it a very arbitrary name so there are all these subtle points that uh, a clever viewer will notice and you must notice these kind of things so then writing very important uh, position is taken on the symbols without ever saying it nobody ever says like a documentary oh this is what the symbols mean no you have to figure it out so the symbols are everywhere so sometimes the symbols are the logo of a king he is very proud saying this is my symbol okay so some symbols are logos of rulers some are certain trades farmers have a symbol this kind of people different kind of trades they have these kind of symbols that symbolize who they are they are like corporate logos you might say then there is a symbol there are certain symbols carved out in copper which are a sign of a token of privilege like a vip pass so uh, mohenjo daro has the upper town and a lower town class structure upper town is for elites lower town people are not allowed to go there it's bear banned it's criminal if you go there unless you have a uh, this particular seal which has a certain kind of uh, uh, thing design on it and this is given to very special people and only though and when you go at the gate of the upper town you have to show this and then they look at you and they let you through so these seals these symbols which we think are maybe alphabets or maybe a writing system for language are not that at all according to this movie and this agrees with the a, a theory that is has been propagated in the last 20 years by western indologists and adopted by many indians according to this these symbols are for trading purposes for status purposes they are they are a privilege of who you are or you are not you carry the right symbol to identify who you are what what you are entitled to so the way they explain this is some merchants bring their stuff indigo material they to sell and at the gate before they are allowed to enter mahendra daro they have to disclose what they are doing how much they are bringing in and what not and so they are given this uh, uh, this uh, seal this kind of a receipt it's like a receipt they are given okay so this uh, the symbolism which is uh, uh, is part of the harappan uh, indus valley harappan mohenjo daro uh, whole indus saraswati uh, you know script undecoded and it hasn't been decided what exactly the script is uh, but in this movie it is clearly uh, that position taken is very clear that this is not a script but these are sort of receipts for 
trading purposes, for economic financial purposes, they are receipts that you take with you. Because in one scene, when these traders come, they are interviewed, disclosed, and when the guy says, okay, you are approved, like in a modern system, they would stamp your passport or they would stamp something. They uh, give them, they make a copy of the seal and give it to them that, okay, now you get in. So that's how uh, the position is taken implicitly without ever saying it, that there was no writing of language at all. But these, amazingly, these are very sophisticated people. They have built huge cities, very consistency, a lot of consistency across space and time, but they don't write. They, they don't wrote down any of these architectural drawings. They don't write down their mathematics. They don't write down their language, grammar, none of that stuff. Uh, they only use writing for trading, trading purposes and status, political, social status. That's the position taken. Horse, very interesting. The horse is there in this movie, okay? But it's also very clearly mentioned that this is a great animal brought from a foreign country. And there's about three or four horses shown altogether, and they have given, they are given a lot of importance in a scene to show that there did exist a horse. But also that this horse is brought by some foreign people. So I think the idea is planted that, okay, horses weren't there native. Horses were coming a little bit from foreign people. So later on come the Vedas, the Vedic Aryans on horses. That sort of fits into this foreign origin theory. It's never mentioned, but the existence of the horse and in saying that these are from a foreign country would fit that. Now, the social structure is very progressive. Women are very emancipated. They are arguing, they're debating, they have rights, they're fighting. Uh, there is a feudal system. There's this bad guy who's the ruler. But there's also a senate, uh, which, which represents various uh, trading uh, groups. Uh, and then there is a revolt and so on. So there is a dynamic social structure. These are progressive people. Uh, they don't, they're not yet captured by Vedas and Hinduism. This is before that. They're very, very advanced. Okay, that's how, that's how uh, it, it comes out. Uh, then um, uh, I already mentioned that uh, things that Hindus will consider very nice and very Hindu exist, but these are by the foreign Aryan Indologist theory people, they will explain these as native elements that have existed in all parts of the world. All parts of the world, they worship mother goddess and rivers and all that. These existed, but the Vedas were brought by outsiders and then these were digested and turned into Hinduism. So when you see Hindu symbols, the saffron wearing priest and the, the, the bhakti puja kind of stuff going on to some deities, it is not our idea of Hinduism. It is that this is pre-Hindu native traditions that were captured, conquered, defeated, assimilated, digested into the Vedic uh, way of life, Vedic framework. Okay. Uh, now, how does Mohenjo-daro get destroyed according to uh, different theories? Uh, some say that uh, the earth shifted, you know, and the river moved, and so this this thing became desolate. Some said that uh, the uh, uh, foreign Aryans came and divide, uh, destroyed it. In this movie, there's a flood. It's a man-made flood because this evil ruler makes a big dam to do something. I won't tell you the full story, but when that dam breaks, this river gets, uh, this uh, town gets destroyed. So he's got his own theory, and maybe this will be made to fit into this, uh, this uh, Noah's Ark, the biblical flood. You know, he leaves open some doors. He doesn't say anything, but he makes those opportunities you know, for further development, let's say. And this, uh, when it gets destroyed, then these people are refugees, they move further east, and they discover this mighty river, and they settle down, and it's called the Ganga. So by implication, the Ganga civilization is sort of a derivative after the previous one got destroyed, and the previous one was actually part of the Middle Eastern civilization. Now, the, um, the um, uh, so I will summarize. Uh, the research he's done is good research, but of a certain kind. Uh, he has not included that there have been discoveries in Haryana of Indus Saraswati sites, which are bigger than Harappa and Mohenjo-daro, bigger than the two of them combined. A town called Rathi Ghadi in Haryana is an Indus Saraswati civilization site bigger than any other known. And then there is Birdana, which is another site discovered, an Indus Saraswati site discovered in Haryana, which is older which is actually, it starts older than uh, Mehergarh or any other city known in the world. And it, it is a city. It starts 
and then it gradually a few thousand years later it what emerges out of it is uh, uh, Indus Saraswati symbols and tiles and stuff. So, it is pre Indus Saraswati civilization becomes Indus Saraswati civilization and then continues thereafter it is still a village today. So, all of this knowledge he has not brought in nor has he factored Dwarka, how do you make Dwarka fit? You see you he is trying to fit the dots. But the, dot, the, the dots that he is including are from the data from the Middle East and from Uzbekistan and uh, Makkah and all of that and he is trying to make all those fit into what is known. Uh, but the data south uh, and east of the Indus Saraswati civilization is just absent. So, that information is not brought in. So, this implication that civilization moves from west to east is actually not true because Rathi Gadi is in Haryana east of uh, you know Mahinjodaro and so is Birdhana in Haryana and these are bigger and older. Today, today uh, this is uh, uh, today is uh, 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 August we are talking middle August, uh, today is August 16, 2016. Uh, a discovery has been announced by the Ministry of Culture in Ladakh of a human settlement 11,000 years from back from today, 11,000 years ago which is older than all of this. So, you see until we connect the dots of all the facts that are known and come up with our own story of what probably what the scenarios are, what may be more likely, less likely and all that, until we do that we do not have an accurate picture. But Mahindra Daro I must say uh, and then you know I also want to point out there is a complete absence of anything to do with yoga, anything to do with Vedic rituals, fire altars, there is no trace of Sanskrit, there is no trace of uh, written, written language. Uh, these kind of things do not really exist there. And so, um, he could say that uh, I am not trying to teach you history, I am just telling you a love story and I could say to him in response that okay, uh, if you want to tell a love story, uh, suppose you tell a love story with the Taj Mahal in the background of some modern man and woman, some people are having a love and then the Taj Mahal is being built and in that you are showing uh, Hindu workers are being exploited and uh, it was a Hindu uh, Rajput king's palace and then this Mughal king came and conquered it and he is remodeling it to make it look like a Muslim thing and suppose you put those hidden secret messages in the background and say I am not telling you any history, it will be controversial. Okay? If you have a exactly same love story, exactly same intrigue and fight between families and all that, but instead of Mahinjodaro if the setting is Kutab Minar where you are showing that these were Hindu temples and they all got destroyed and this Kutab Minar got built and there is one scene where the guy says okay break those, uh, break those murtis and put them on the floor and we walk on them, another sign where they are capturing some Hindu slaves and making them work. If you have subtle si uh, few shots all you need is a couple seconds here and there, few shots to convey the, the historical political prejudice or point of view you are conveying, it would, it would make a huge statement and people would notice it and they should notice it, you see. So, it is not so innocent that you are just telling a story because you are telling it very clearly in the background of a certain historical setting, a mighty city you know and you are addressing the issue of what is its script, what are, what about horses, uh, what about uh, deities versus puja uh, versus the Vedic stuff, the absence of certain sans, uh, the entire Vedic Sanskrit stuff, the presence, huge presence repeated over and over again of West Asian languages. Every time there is somebody they will say okay speaking Makkan which is Makkah language from you know Makkah speaking Bukharan from Bukhara. So, all those are being mentioned, it is not uh, about the love story, uh, those are mentioned because they have some their historical signatures. So, I will conclude by saying do not trivialize this, it is not a bad movie, it is not a harmful movie, it is an educational movie where you can pick out all these points and learn to argue better, be better informed and uh, do not think it is only entertainment, it is very good entertainment, family can enjoy, but I would suggest before you take friends or family, give them a little overview about like I did to the people I went with and they enjoyed it because they then started pointing out these things to me. Uh, the people I went with I told them a little bit about this background, what to look for, I had not seen the movie and I said these are the things I am going to be looking for. So, let us see, will there be horses, what do they say about language, what do they say about writing, what will there be Vedic stuff. So, if you do it that way, it will be entertainment, it will be educational. So, do see it uh, and then, then let us discuss further, okay. So, with that I will sign off. 
thank you for watching namaste until next time